Alright everyone, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be going over the three prompts from TSCST 2020. If you want to see where the prompts are, look at the website. I'll have a... Uh, once the third day is done in January, I'll have all three prompts on the website complete with the official solutions. So this is just for the people who want to see the solutions extra early. I'll be talking about the solutions, a little bit about the background of the problems. And yeah, let's get started. <laughs> Oh my god, Twitch. Alright, so let's start with round 4. So, I'm gonna first start by stating at the risk of stating the obvious, GCD of A and B is going to be equal to 1. So, finally, Cypher Man. No. So, I'm gonna. Alright, first of all, there, GCD of A and B is equal to 1. And this tells you that I can sort of treat the problem as a single divisibility. I can say a b divides a to the 4 plus 1 and... Well, the way that I'm going to want to write it is this. So, once I notice that these two guys are relatively prime, a problem condition like 1 and 2 I can capture in a single line like this. Like a minus b to all to the 4th plus 1. And the reason that I want to do this is that I'm trying to go for some size contradiction. Um, where I'm trying to say this guy is actually like bigger-ish than this guy. That's where this third condition is going to come in because I know that the floor of squared A and floor of squared B are like roughly equal to each other. So let's make this precise now. Um, let me make sure that I don't screw up these inequalities. We think that this is actually going to be about right because if like say, let, let's say like the floor of square root A, floor of square root B is like some large number like 100, that means that A and B are somewhere between like 10,000 and 10,200. So this difference is like on the order of like one, uh, 160 million and this thing is about 1 million and the difference is a factor of 16 that's constant. Uh, so to make this precise, let's say um, let's say n is equal to the floor. So then what happens is the size of AB is at least n to the fourth, whereas uh, the size of A minus B is less than 2n to the 4. Uh, not strictly less. This kind of is less than equal to. Less than equal to n to the 4th plus 1. So, when the dust settles, what that means is that this quotient, which I'll denote by k now, uh, is less than or equal to 16. Bye forever. Uh... I guess? Hello. Um. Cool. So this is strong. It's like, okay, at this point, we've kind of used up all the conditions that we have is this finite, like these finitely many cases where for every value of k, there's like, an e like a single equation. And again, like the reason I did this is this floor thing basically promises you that the solution is going to be somehow based on size. So when you write it this way and get this guy to be small, this is what I want. So now at this point, if you know things about orders, um, this will help you a lot. Claim, like x to the 4 has only 1 mod 8 or 2 as potential prime factors. This is a very standard orders argument. It's like you say x to the 4 is minus 1 mod a prime p, so x to the 8 is 1, so modulo any prime p. Um, x has order 8, unless negative 1 is 1, so that's where that happens. But, also, I might as well remark that, uh, yeah, A and B, can A and B both be odd? That seems fine. Can A be even and B be odd? Yeah, okay, so the way I get rid of 2 is also um, can't have A, B, 
with. Hang on a minute. Let's see. Yeah, I, I want to weed out the 5 factor 2. I think I shouldn't. Like, 4 isn't going to happen because actually, X the 4th plus 1 is never 0 mod 4. Um, so I just need to prevent it from being 2 mod 4, which would imply B is like 1 mod 4 and A is 0 mod 4. Or A is 1 mod 2 and 0 mod 2. Uh, yeah, so. Also, V2 of X the 4 plus 1 is always at most 1. And if B minus A is odd. Then A, B is even. There we go. So, I don't think this is even K equals 1 or 2. Like, I, I think you would roll out 2 because if... If the numerator has is divisible by 2, so is the denominator. And the numerator only has one factor of 2. So, um, consequently, K equals 1. Yeah, so K is 1, and then we're great. We're like, alright, now there's only one equation I have to solve. So, that's fine. K equals 1, so now what are we doing? We're trying to solve the equation AB equals A minus B to the 4th plus uh, 1. B minus A, A minus B, whatever you want. And we're like, okay, well... <laughs> it's an equation, let's just do it! <laughs> so, we'll... We'll do what is definitely not the buffalo way, and we'll let b equals a plus d, where d is at least zero. And... Expand. Yeah. And then what you get is, like, you get a times... a plus d equals d to the 4 plus 1. And as people in Twitch channel say, this is actually just the quadratic in... This is quadratic in a. A quadratic equation in A. So, all you need is the discriminant to be a perfect square. Discriminant to be a square, and that discriminant is given exactly by B squ so D squared minus 4 D to the 4 plus 1 equals 4 D to the 4 plus D squared plus 4. You can literally say a b greater than n to the 4. Oh, that's probably true. I just bound this directly. Ah, oh, that requires a brain though. <laughs> so, Spartacle says this is With less than n plus 1 to the 4, why? Okay. Okay, we can do that, that's fine. We'll go with Twitch up. Uh, however, n to the 4 less than ab, less than n plus 1 to the 4 because of. By the givens, so require a b equals n to the 4 plus 1 equals b minus a to the 4 plus 1. So what do I do in this state? <sighs> it didn't say anything about order pairs. Pairs are always 
You should always assume ordered pairs unless it's as otherwise, like with, with the parentheses notation. Uh, does I divide 17? No. I'm just going to solve the quadratic so I don't get myself too confused. Basically, you want this to be a perfect square, and whenever you have a polynomial whose leading coefficient is a square and which is even degree, you can bound the number of times it's a perfect square by sandwiching it between two squares. This guy is between 4d to the 4 and uh, 2d squared plus 1 all squared. So this requires... Sorry, do d squared. This is for d greater than 1. And this inequality is actually strict as well, so okay. Yeah. So this requires d is less either equal to 0 or 1. When you solve, this extracts the pairs 1, 1, 1, 2, uh, 2, 1. Evan, I need your opinion on this. Does 1.5 divide 6? Um, first of all, why? Second of all, for any definition, yes. You can either, if your definition of divide is the dumb one where you say the quotient is an integer, then yes, I mean the quotient is 4. If your question is, does 1.5 divide 6 as elements of q, the answer is yes, but over a field, divisibility is stupid. Um, if you have an arbitrary ring, you can, why is that the dumb one? Uh, I mean, for 3VT's question, it doesn't make sense. Like, if, if you're working over the ring Z, it's fine. But if you're, like... <laughs> I don't know, what do, what do you offer me in general? Like... In, oh, for a general ring R, you say that, like, A divides B... So there is a definition for a ring. Like, it's just, you say A divides B if, like, there is an element of the ring such that A times R equals B. The problem is that, like, the ring containing 1.5 and 6 is probably a, like... Well, I mean, presumably you were in Q, and then it's stupid. For a general ring? Oh, sorry. For a general commutative ring, because I only... I assume my rings are commutative. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Let's go on. Oh, right, I forgot to tell you about where this prompt comes from. Um, so, the, the very long story is that this problem is the key result of the following paper, uh, 1903. 02067.pdf And I will actually put it on for you guys to see Where da -da -da. Bandera. Where is it? something here yeah I don't actually understand the details but the context that the authors tell me is that um, you have a pair of elliptic curves over you have a pair of elliptic curves over and I'm just saying the words I don't know what these words mean FAFB such that the number of points on one is the field size of the other And the relevant buzzword here is has bound gives you n squared less than a b less than n plus one squared. Thank you, 3VT for the chair. Yeah, and the divisibility conditions are telling you something that the embedding degree of each curve is eight. 
This is just what the author notes that I got sensei. Uh, Yang Liu. Yeah, so when you look at the paper, my understanding is that this this problem is the 8-8 in this proposition. Um, like the... The 8s somehow encode this A divides B to the 4 plus 1, B divides A to the 4 plus 1 thing. And, yeah. So you can see the 16 C, the 16 thing coming up, the Q. Cool. Let's go on. So for problem 5, for the people that weren't here earlier, um, authors are Ashwin, Sa, and Matab, Sony. A device is order A, B equals A. Yeah, I think something like this. So there's a few various look solutions, but let me first draw a picture. Um, so this problem comes from the context behind this problem is Young Tableau. And so I'm going to draw my set S accordingly. Um, but I mean, you can also use points. It doesn't matter for the contest itself. So, points that look like this, and I couldn't figure out what did what that did. It doesn't do anything. It's just the the context that the problem came from is Young Tableau. But knowing the word Young Tableau or any of the related theorems like the hook length formula does absolutely nothing for helping you solve this. Actually, maybe that's unless like you also happen to like know the result. I guess that's possible. <laughs> the height always decrease. By a most one. This set is bad. What do you mean this set? Is, did I screw up? Are you playing this? What? Is this a known result? I have to look at the author notes again. I didn't copy them down carefully. Um, Oh, because oh, like Evan, you should check out the categories on your screen. Oh, the cat. Oh, <laughs> dang it! Uh, that that's a mistake. Yeah, normally I have a calendar reminder to fit change the category back to science and technology, um, before the stream starts. Uh, but I didn't have, but I have a special stream, so I forgot to claim I am not playing Stefan Sausage Roll. Uh, Alright. Yeah, okay. Maybe it is less, it is more believable if I do that. So, um, the thing I want is that, like, this, this thing looks like a staircase. So if I take, like, a set P, a point P, This one is arbitrary, but I'm going to just look at this one in particular. Um, idea, staircase. This is not is it literally a staircase because it's a young tableau, but a staircase is a rectangle plus two staircases. And that's sort of what I'm going to do here. Why transfer to MIT? Uh, I wrote a blog post about it at some point. You can look it up. Basically, I fit in better at MIT. Is a short version. Like, I do not like random housing. I want to live with my friends. <laughs> yeah, I, I transferred from Harvard to MIT when I was an undergrad. So. Let me nail down the exact definition. Um, we'll say like a, a point, a square P, a cell P is pivotal. If P plus one comma one is absent 
and the red rectangle has even size. So this one should be not there, and then I want this red rectangle to even size. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to split my sets into two types. So if it contains P, if a set contains P, and if a set doesn't contain P. So if the set doesn't contain P, then, I mean, you delete P and everything above it, and I still have a young tuplo left, so you can just straight use the induction hypothesis. And if it does contain P, then you can, then the set has to contain this whole red rectangle. So now I have two more staircases, and you can say, let's call this guy staircase one. Let's call this guy staircase two. Uh, I'm using the word staircase when I really should say young tableau, but staircase is better. It, it communicates intuition better. So even sets E1, E2 plus odd one, odd two. And the number of odd sets is E1, O2 plus O1, E2. And by induction hypothesis, E1 is bigger than O1, E2, number of even sets here is bigger than O2, so then, yeah, E1 minus O1, E2 minus O2 is non-negative, and we're done. And that's it! <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't... You can call it re-enrichment inequality, I wouldn't really call it that, honestly. I guess that is what it is. I just think of it this way because it's like such a special case. I feel like when I, when I see these expressions, I automatically know that even one is bigger. Thank you, ABT, for the cheer. I should mention that this is this solution was given by Nikolai Beluhov. It was not the author's original solution. The author sent in some monstrosity with a lot of partition symbols, and then Nikolai came up with this solution, so I didn't read the monstrosity. <laughs> Am I using three? Uh, PCs. I have. <laughs> you can look at the picture um, on the page there, but I have one gaming PC, one with three monitors attached, one iPad, and one laptop. Thank you, Fukano, too, for the shout out. Yes, we recently hit one of his subs. Okay, let's go on to the geometry. Yeah, we also broke 1024. I think by the time I got the email that said I had 1000 subs, the number was actually like 1080 or something like that. Okay, 
Uh, we got a 30 second ad break a few minutes ago, so we'll take a quick break while I try to figure out what message from 3VT apparently I missed. Uh, and... We got it, we're doing the outbreak, doing the outbreak. Yeah, if you missed the solution to five, here is it. This is this is roughly a complete solution. Um what you do is that I I should comment that a cell is like a pivotal cell exists, but it's very easy to see that one exists. If the first row has at least two cells, you're fine. If not, the second, any, take the first cell of the second row. What was the solution? I will put the, I will post the author's solution at some point, but I actually haven't read it because it's just like, I think it's just worse than this one. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Dada Calculator, for the cheer. I wasn't paying attention. I didn't realize the name had changed. Yes, you can just pick red rectangle to of even size. Uh, but, so you don't need it to be like the. You only need one one to be missing. So the argument goes: if the first row has at least two cells, one of them works. And yeah, even number of squares. And if the first row is only one cell, then and this cell doesn't work, then the one below it works. That's the whole argument for why there's a why you can pick a blue cell. That argument seems pretty crucial. Alright, thanks started for the cheer. <laughs> Who wrote problem four? Problem four is Yang Liu. Um That's fair. Yeah, I am using something when I do this. But no no. Okay, let's see the geo. I will say, I think the hardest part of this problem 6 is that the number was 6 and it looks really scary. So even if like not a lot of people solve it, I might not be convinced that this problem is hard. Um, but I might be at least convinced that it's like not 1-4. Yeah. I did that show up twice. You go away. All right, so let's let T to know the concurrency part. Yeah, I'm presenting the hyperbola solution. No. Um, I actually haven't looked into it, although I can, I can, yeah, I haven't actually read your solution posted yet. <laughs> yeah, this problem exists. <laughs> okay, so let's keep the concurrency point, and as everyone knows, not everyone knows this, but the thing about this problem, for the people that haven't seen this before, the converse of this problem is very, very classical. If A, B, C, D and C are cyclic, then in complex numbers, um, like the orthocenter is A plus B plus C, so like the line through D and the orthocenter of ABC and the three other symmetric lines will all meet at, in fact, have midpoints A plus B plus C plus D over two. So, 
So the converse is, I'll, I'll just say the converse is very classical. If you haven't seen it, pull out complex numbers, do it. It won't take you very long. So we're trying to go the other way. So t is the midpoint given these conditions. So what I'm going to say is that first of all, aq is parallel to bp because they're both perpendicular to ac. Also, those lines are different from each other. So I'll write AQ parallel B, PB, those are the dark red ones, and then apply the symmetric thing to say that um, BR parallel to QC and CP parallel to RA. So now you have what we... So now if you look at AQ, C, P, B, R, um, opposite sides are parallel and diagonals are concurrent at T. And this is enough to tell you that the hexagon is centrally symmetric around the point T. So that will, that so basically the parallel and the concurrence is enough to give you the things you want. And then Like when someone naturally think about the converse, like yeah, I don't I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> like it's not like we're trying to hide it. It's still like the, the problem is to prove it even with knowledge of the converse. Okay. Um. Anyways, to finish, because PD is perpendicular to BC and. That's so that's parallel to QR. Um, you get that D is the orthocenter of PQR. Yeah, at this point, you get the parallelogram, so this is perpendicular. So great, D is the orthocenter of PQR, and by symmetry. Yeah, T is also the midpoint of DH. That's the last piece. So the parallels give you, this is the main work here, is this step. It's like, okay, I have a hexagon whose opposite sides are parallel and whose um, diagonals concur at a point. And then, there we go. Why is Evan complex? How am I over complex? Like, I'm just presenting a solution. Is this like, is it this like shorter? Okay, I don't know. Like, I don't even construct any additional points. <laughs> I'm about to because I had to get the cyclic, but anyways. Okay, so T is the midpoint of A, P, B, Q, C, R, D, H. How do I get that D is the orthocenter? So what happens, this is the big step. Once I have it centrally symmetric, I already have three of the midpoints and I just need the fourth one. So at this time, I already know that IE ABC is reflection of PQR through T. So that will give you the orthocenter already because like it will tell you that P, D, and A, H are both per perpendicular to QR, and so on. I 
shrink the font size a little. Why can't we say BCQR is parallelogram? It's this step here. Like, if I have a parallelogram, if I have a hexagon who's... If I have a hexagon whose opposite sides are parallel and whose diagonals are concurrent, then it is... Then it is like, uh... What a, it's centrally symmetric. I agree this problem does not belong in a number 3 slot, the issue is like the problem 5 doesn't as well, so like what do you want me to do? Man, I said I wasn't going to talk about the... Okay. Is essentially a symmetric thing well known? I wouldn't say it's well known, but it's not very hard to check. Like, um... I, okay, I'll, I'll draw a picture because people seem stuck on to be hung up on that step and I want to convince you that the step is actually easy. So... button so here's the claim claim if you have a hexagon and the diagonals are concurrent and the the corresponding sides are parallel then midpoint okay so here's the proof um so I, actually i'll use the same point names what did i say aqc ppr right so because parallel lines a ah, i need to name that point um T. So AT over TB is equal to QT over TP. Oh, frick. Ah! I flipped the points! Uh, okay, let's try that again. I was like, why is it so not symmetric? Alright, let's try that again. AT over TP is equal to QT over TB, and then again by parallel lines, that's equal to uh, CT over TR. And again by parallel lines, that's equal to TP over P PT over AT, TA, or whatever. So therefore, they're all equal to 1. Or, yeah, Brian Khan plus Pascal works too. <laughs> <laughs> but that that sounds fancier than it needs to be. How is ATQT over TB? Uh, because like this AQ is parallel to BP, like the parallel lines. This is since like AQ parallel BP. Okay, so it sounds like I have to write that out in the solutions then, because maybe people might get confused if I... I just, like, said this is true, uh, but I guess I should write it out. Evan, why do you use dollar at number percent instead of the usual at number percent dollar? <laughs> uh, 
So the quote unquote usual way to do this is that yeah, it's two, three, four, yeah, it's two, three, four, five. And this is completely off topic, but the story is that when I was like um, 11, actually probably younger than that, probably when I was like nine, um, I was reading like a comic book. I think it was like a Yu-Gi-Oh manga or something. And there was a place where a character swore and he used like um, dollar at number percent. And when I saw that, I didn't know what it meant because I was too young. So I memorized the sequence of the characters and uh, still remember it apparently. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's actually really easy to remember. The way you remember it is you imagine it's telling you that the amount of money you have has just decreased by a factor of 100. So dollar at number percent, the way I remembered it when I was nine is like it was saying that the amount of money I had decreased by a factor of 100. Oh, uh, so that's why I still remember the sequence of characters. No, at is literally at. Number, uh, dollar is money and number is amount. Okay, uh, let, let's finish. So... Let S be the centroid. And then let O equals... Oh no. Lots of care. Uh, another lots of care. Uh, one moment please. Lots is very brittle. Let O equals 2 times S minus T. Okay, then claim O is equidistant from everyone. So up at this point, we know that like each like vertex is the, um, yeah. We have all the ortho center conditions. So like PQR, T are all, sorry, PQR, H are all ortho centers, blah, blah, blah. And everything is great. And so now to all we have to do to finish is that claim O is the desired point. Why is that true? Let's just prove OB is equal to OC. Um, so T is the midpoint of the foot from A and D. And the projection here is like the lands on the average of them. So I'll, I'll do it this way. Let's let's call a prime, o prime, s prime, d prime. Look at the x coordinates. Is basically what I'm saying. If I look at the x coordinates, um, then s prime is the average of a prime plus d prime plus b plus c, whereas t prime is the average of a and d. So now O prime is the average of B and C. So basically just look at the X coordinates and the X coordinate of O is the average of the X coordinates of B and C because this is the average of A and D and this is the average of all four. So the X coordinate does what I want and that concludes the proof. I need to shrink things a little. Um...